Before we get to the movie, I want to talk a little bit about The Simpsons. They came around when we were in high school. I have no doubt that they were a major influence on our comedy sensibilities and our creative sensibilities. And just in our language, so many things that we say comes out of The Simpsons. That's kind of what I want to talk about. What Simpsons quotes do you find kind of rolling around in your head on a regular basis? Whenever I'm making a toast, I'm guaranteed to say, gentlemen to evil. My absolute favorite Simpsons quote of all time is when Grandpa Simpson's bearded friend runs into a drunken Waylon Smithers and says, Hey, this sidewalk's for regular walking, not fancy walking. <laughs> Another quote that often comes up in my head when I'm editing this show is if I find a, a way to kind of rearrange the footage in a novel way to make an idea clearer or to just make a joke funnier, always in my head I hear, I am so smart. I am so smart. S-M-R-T. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. For tonight's movie, I thought we would watch something lighthearted and fun, but also a little dangerous. Ooh. And you won't find anyone more fun or more in danger, I suspect. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I'll find out. Jeez. Tonight we're watching Modesty Blaze. This is a name that I only fleetingly hear like every five years, and she's supposed to be of massive cultural importance to a small amount of culture. Released in 1966, Modesty Blaze stars Monica Vitti in her first English-speaking role, Dirk Bogard, and Basement alum Terrence Stamp. Based on the comic strip of the same name by Peter O'Donnell, the screenplay was written by Evan Jones and Harold Pinter. The director was Joseph Luzi. You're a Luzi baby, so why don't you kill ye? Willie, the Terrence Stamp role, was originally intended for Michael Caine, Stamp's former flatmate. Instead, Caine starred in Alfie, a role originally intended for Terrence Stamp, his former flatmate. I think that was their lot in life for the late 60s, early 70s, constantly getting each other's roles. The character of Vincent Vega in the film Pulp Fiction is seen multiple times reading a Modesty Blaze book. For your gift, I thought I'd give you something appropriately psychedelic. It's this. The whirl o Color morphing launching toy. whirl o Whoa. Look at it whirl. A whole new whirl o Check that out. So it sticks to it? No, it says launch it. I think it's a like a frisbee type thing. Someday I hope to see that thing in person. You will. And you guys, I would love to see you guys in person. Yeah. I'm fine with being second to the Whirlo. So put on your thigh-high boots and load up your Walter PPK and sneak on over to the old leather couch where we'll be engaging in some campy espionage with Modesty Blaze. Burn it down, Blaze. Manna caviti. What a sweetie. Does she live on the Space Needle? <laughs> Modesty Blaze lounges in her bedroom. She's a notorious international thief, but right now she's having breakfast. Your Sanka, madam. Monica Vitti eats a bear claw. That was the topic of a lot of male fantasies in the 60s. Of the underworld, you'll be accepted in the queue. I'm also a master of the underworld, known as the basement. A spy walks about London. The man goes to press on a doorbell and... He was working for the English government. They're working on this deal with Abu Tahir for an expensive oil concession. And they're paying him $50 million in diamonds. This guy who blew up was supposed to make the transfer of the diamonds. So they need to bring in someone else. We must have Modesty Blaze. International thief to handle the diamonds. If you deceive me, I may take your diamonds. i just kidding. I take them anyway. <laughs> Those men should smile less. I will do it, but I need Willie Garvin. Hello. Hello, hello. Willie Garvin is like a male Modesty Blaze. I know Abuta here. 
They're old friends. She came like a shot with Willie Garvin. <laughs> what a character. <laughs> You know, if he spent as much time on his accent as he had his what? <laughs> Across the ocean, Gabriel, another international thief, returns to his secluded island stronghold. His right-hand woman is Mrs. Fothergill. And then, of course, there's his accountant, McWhirter. You've no sense of the true value of money, McWhirter. Nevertheless, it all affects the final balance sheet. <laughs> Glassware is ridiculous. <laughs> and there's also this mime. I'll never talk. Oh. Crap. <laughs> this movie's like a fine automobile. It goes from dull to ridiculous in seconds. <laughs> Do you like my hood? It is a cone. My veterinarian does not want me to chew on the wound. <laughs> Modesty is on the job. She's in Amsterdam. Dublin. Murder. Non sequitur. She takes a tour of the canals. Tiboria, Bird of London. If you look to your left, you'll see the hive vag vag. Someone drops a bomb into the water. <laughs> but nobody's hurt. And there's Willie. Ladra di bicicletta! Modesty sneaks into this fancy apartment. She sneaks around. Modesty, just tell us where you are. Just whisper it. <laughs> See, she's closing the curtains. This is that modesty she's so famous for. All right, Monica, in this scene, we don't have a script per se. Just move around and use the space. The guy who owns the apartment comes home. I think his name is Paul. He and Modesty get into a fight. Pillow fight. He doesn't recognize her because they actually know each other. Paul is the guy who currently knows where the diamonds are. Give us the charcuterie. Modesty blaze. Modesty bathes. And they capture Modesty and Paul. Let's see. It uh, can't wait about 15 minutes, can it? No. You can tell this is an old movie because his telephone cord was rope-like. <laughs> you can tell it's an English movie because he had post-coital tea. <laughs> Willie and Sir Gerald to the rescue. Good morning. Good night. Willie and Blaze go down to a little carnival. They're going down there to meet up with Nicole, who's getting some information for them. Run, lady, it's Gary Busey. These goons chase her. Hey, has anybody here seen a dark-haired lady? I, I'm looking for her. <laughs> Honey, I'm bored. Let's go to the place where they have the constant deafening calliope music. And they end up killing her. Before I die, let's make out. Too late. Modesty and man. I've written down modesty and man. <laughs> okay, she's been sleeping with this Paul guy. They enjoy some champagne. And she poisons him and knocks him out. You broke your part of the bargain. I now consider myself a free agent modesty. I'm going to go get those diamonds. Meanwhile, on his island, Gabriel attempts to eat lunch. I thought so. Take it away, Enrico. I got to tell you, Craig... Yeah. I'm on the verge of fast-forwarding. <laughs> I'm really having to restrain myself. Of course she does. Of course she does. Yes, Mrs. Fabigal? Borg has failed. Stupid, stupid bar. Willie and Modesty are bopping along. They're wearing funny hats. And they sing a little song. They all believed it was in the story. And we took nine curtain combs. And see, this is a pointless scene that's enjoyable. I like this. And they're chased down by these cars. Should we have a laugh? Do, do. It's the English government, and Paul is there. We're going to take you guys into custody because we don't want you to go after those diamonds. But those cigarette packs are actually smoke bombs. <laughs> and those funny hats are smoke... hats. Willie and Modesty get away. Now we are Knights Templar. Gabriel calls up Modesty and invites her to come on to his boat. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba! <laughs> Dance, 
Dance to the bland music. Dance, I tell you! Oh, she's got a peacock feather. My cats would love this scene. And they have a little spot of lunch. Uh, and then Mrs. Farthingale comes and bam, knocks her on the head and knocks her out. And she is now a prisoner. While you were out, you've been given a new wardrobe and makeover. And so is Willie. You've got three hours to master the job. Rehearsal will start in five minutes. We'll be doing Fiddler on the Roof on the Upper Deck. We're renaming it Fiddler on the Upper Deck. Scorpio. After this caper, Mrs. Fothergill would go on to get a job at the Witch Ballet School in Suspiria. Gabriel's got this fancy submarine, and he's going to put Willie and one of his guys in there, and they're going to go to the Tiboria, and they're going to steal the diamonds. Now look here, Walter. I'm going to dive into you, and don't you go in my lungs. You hear me, Walter? Terrence Stamp threatens the ocean. A one-act play by Matt Sloan. <laughs> it's kind of like an airlock that they put to the bottom of a boat. They go into the airlock, and then they can crawl up into the boat, steal the diamonds, and be on their merry way. You must learn to sip your pleasures, Mrs. Fothergill. Don't gulp them all down at one go. Like a strange drink from a funny cup. And the diamonds are taken back to Gabriel's Island. Now that I have the diamonds, and now that I have you, the both of you will be my prisoners. Modesty is put in this weird cell. The Holy Mountain called. They want their room back. But she goes up the staircase, and there's a trap door that leads to Gabriel's office. Let's team up. I'll get rid of Mrs. Fothergill in a bullet way, and you do the same to Willie, and then we'll be partners. And possibly lovers? Does that work for you? No, it doesn't. Modesty escapes from her cell. She uses her feminine wiles. And she goes off to free Willie. <laughs> and then she pulls the skin off of Willie's back. It's full of gadgets. One of those is a robo bird. <laughs> tweet, tweet, caw, caw. I am robo bird. While all this is happening, Gabriel is talking to his accountant yet again. You see, Garfield tricked Odie. It was just... <laughs> it's delightful. <laughs> they steal the diamonds. While Modesty is waiting for Willie, Miss Fevthesjurser shows up. She and Modesty have a little kung fu fight. Ah. A rope gets tied around Miss F's neck. They use the bucket to get down to the shore, but the alarms sound. They've been found out, and there's all kinds of gunfire coming at them. I haven't done this yet. Eh. He doesn't even know I'm doing it. That's it for us. I think th this is the end of the road. The Arabs come to the rescue. Boats and boats of them, and they've got guns, and they've got horses. While this epic battle is going on, Modesty and Willie sing another little song. And sail away now. <coughs> about how they're going to hang up their international thievery and they're going to get married. Can't it just be over? Make it over! Sir? It is I, Robo Bird. Cheap, cheap. Oh, my life. Back at Abu Tahir's camp, the oil is flowing. The goat's milk is flowing over Willie's body. The diamonds are secure. <laughs> and that is Modesty Blaze. Well, look who's here. This guy. Hi, baby. Santino. Plump little fella that he is. There's a serious little fella. I don't have any teeth. Don't make me smile. Hey. Hey, buddy. Oh. Look at what I've done. Stop making my baby cry. Modesty Blaze. I hated it. <laughs> I did not enjoy it uh, while we were watching it up until about the last 20 minutes, and then everything started to make sense to me. Now, can I explain the sense? I don't know. I didn't hate this because it was a bad movie. I hated it because it was. <laughs> because there's a good spy romp buried in this mess. This movie should have been 40 minutes shorter, but there's just so many 
pointless and long scenes and talking scenes and they talk so slowly. Everyone has a different accent from a, different countries that don't exist. But you know what you just described there? Every single spy movie ever. <laughs> Monica Vitti is totally misused here. I think she was capable of carrying that role had she been given the proper direction and the proper script. And had she not just been used as a sex pot and a clothes mannequin. Literally changing clothes as often as possible so that we could see her in every costume that known to man. I would say that Michael Caine traded up. Oh, yeah. There's a kid crying in the next room. I got to go see where uh, Christina is. You mind holding for a minute? Sure. Stay tuned. Man, even Craig's baby hates this movie. All right. Another major problem with this movie is Dirk Bogard, who I found completely dull. There was one point with him where I'm like, oh, I get this now. He's a super villain who, A, is really into the mundane task of being a super villain. Secondly, the fact that he does seem to have this overstrong sense of morality when it comes to killing people. If there wasn't so much noise in the movie, mm -hmm. those parody elements would have come through a lot stronger. Can you hear the baby? Don't worry about it. Okay. I won't worry about my baby. <laughs> I haven't read a lot of Harold Pinter. What is he like as a writer? If you think about David Mamet, make David Mamet British, have even more spare dialogue, and remove all the profanity, that's a lot like what Harold Pinter would be. Very, very dry. Hey, you see that? That? Yeah, that. But the writing in this movie is the exact opposite of that. I, I can't figure out what he brought to the project. I don't know what Sam Shepard brought to the Brisky Point. You know what's important that they took away from it? A paycheck. That's, that's what it is. This movie did have things going for it. It did have a tremendous amount of style. <laughs> Almost too much style. You could say that style wins the movie, but when style wins, the audience loses. The scene with the smoke bombs was nice. A little bit of spy gadgetry. That apartment that she sneaks into. I'd like to spend a couple hours there. Roll around on the floor for a while. I would just like to look through their record collection. I imagine it's all just Serge Gainsbourg. Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> now that we're talking about it, it doesn't seem like as bad a movie as it was. It was very obnoxious to watch, but I kind of want to watch it again. I just remember being instantly frustrated with it. Two minutes in, and that's tough to come back from. We've watched Modesty Blaze, and now it's time for us to blaze a trail on over to Seen It. Seen It? Oh, I'm English. Oh, I've seen it. See? How's that? <laughs> I really could blend in in Nockinghamshire. Spending all this time indoors, you've been watching a lot of movies and television shows. You've been listening to a lot of music. Hopefully, you've been doing a lot of reading. And that's why our theme for Seen It is Seen It Reddit. Movies based on books. Mr. Sandpaper writes, if you want to talk about non-traditional horror, then talk about No Country for Old Men. The character Anton Chigurh is scarier than any movie monster from the last 20 years. Seriously. Seen it? Read it. Seen it, friendo. This is one of the more accurate adaptations of a movie. Uh, there's only one scene cut out of the book. Everything else is right there in McCarthy's text. It's the most well-adapted movie from a book I've ever seen. But that doesn't mean that they didn't deserve their Oscar, those cone boys. The movie is not about aging. It's about times changing and people who aren't able to change with them. Woody Harrelson, Tommy Lee Jones, and Josh Brolin are all the old men that the title is talking about. I wonder if, in preparation for this role, Javier Bardem studied reptiles. Because he's got that iguana look about him. It's one of the great villain roles of all time, undoubtedly. And he's so specific in the blankness. You know, he doesn't have a blank facial expression. He has a very specific facial expression meant to convey no information. He's a good actor, that Javier Bardem. Yeah, he won an Oscar for that. And he was in The Counselor. You want to know about women? You just dance. Chicka, 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 chicka. <laughs> Stuart Benvy writes, have you guys seen The Maltese Falcon? Only saw it recently and loved it. Seen it. Seen it? Read it. I read this uh, probably 25 years ago. It was a roommate's copy. The specific thing I remember is that Sam Spade has sex with the woman 
and it's a very vaguely written scene. And that's immediately followed by a very detailed scene of him making sandwiches. Now, the movie is John Huston's first movie, and it has so much going for it. It, uh, it came out the same year as Citizen Kane. It has a lot of the same innovations as Citizen Kane, but it's not overbearing in that way. Momo writes, hi, fellas. What do you say to Peck's Moby Dick? Seen it? Read it. I started reading Moby Dick twice. I started it twice, too, and then I finished it the third time. Do I recommend the book? Read it if you want to. Uh, but as for the Peck movie, I think it's a blast. This is a lot of book. Uh, when you're reading it, you might think that it's an unfilmable because there's so much text and poetry and weird essay chapters. Turns out it's very easy to adapt because all you need to do is cut all of that out. And when you remove all that, it's just an adventure story about a whaling ship. Houston and Ray Bradbury, who did the screenplay, were really, really good at paring it down to just the essentials. And the experience of collaborating with John Huston would scar Ray Bradbury for life. Peck was famously too young for the role. He, was, he wasn't even 40 yet at the time when he's supposed to be playing someone who's around 60 years old. So evidently, Houston didn't give him any direction at all. He does fine, but he doesn't do great. And in conclusion, burr, 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 I'm Gregory Peck. And Marby Dirk. I'm Captain Ahab, going after the wide web. Burr, burr, burr. Just Jake writes, I am curious about what is the source of contention Matt has for the Brothers Hughes direction of From Hell. Seen it. Haven't seen it, but I've read it. I guess I don't really have as much of a problem with the Hughes Brothers for that movie. I think I have more of an issue with the screenwriters Terry Hayes and Rafael Iglesias. Because From Hell is the best graphic novel ever made. And I realize that makes Watchmen number two, and I'm fine with that. I have never been so gripped and captivated and revolted by a piece of art as I have by this. And the movie From Hell is just a dumb murder mystery. One of the things that you learn from the graphic novel From Hell is that the whores of England were not glamorous. They were at the bottom of society. And in the movie, the main prostitute is played by Heather Graham, and she looks like she's been sitting in a makeup chair for 12 hours. She's radiantly, angelically beautiful, and she just has one little smudge of dirt on the cheek. <laughs> that may not be a significant thing to get pissed off at, but it's emblematic of everything that's wrong with the movie. The fact that they make it a whodunit, where the book is not a whodunit at all. You immediately know who do it. There's a swingin' place that you can go to known as our website, welcome to thebasementshow.com. All of our episodes are there. You can watch them, and there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on to donate to support our show. The continued support of our patrons on our website is so appreciated and awe inspiring, and uh, we just love it. Thank you very much. And here's two of them. Christopher, who says, thank you for the years of entertainment. You've taught me to look at movies critically and expose me to titles I would have never found on my own. And he asks about a movie that I have seen, and so I put it on our seen it list, and we'll talk about it on an episode in the future. And then there's Daniel Meyer, a personal friend. Yes, he is. I almost bought his house. <laughs> True story. Daniel Meyer. Great show for so many years. The last episode showed you guys are light years beyond everyone on how to do a quarantine show. It still felt like you guys had amazing chemistry through such awkward circumstances. Well, thank you, Dan. I hope you're doing well down in Chicago. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Well, we're going to sail off into the sunset in the boat full of diamonds that we know as the basement, and now you can watch this. We must have modesty blaze.